So, welcome everybody. We will start. So, we are OVH. Uh, you probably heard about us uh, this morning during the keynote. We are a cloud provider. And um, we are here to share you a little bit about our experience uh, on uh, Swift uh, infrastructure management and uh, what we did with uh, the automata automation uh, part. My name is uh, Jean-Daniel Bonto. I work at OVH since two years uh, as a technical evangelist. You can find me on Twitter with my nickname. And as I'm not the technical guy, I, ca I came with Romain. And uh, I'm Romain, so I'm a developer at OVH uh, since uh, three years, and I've been working on Swift for almost three years. I'm one of the two guys of the Swift team uh, at OVH, and I'm sometimes uh, on the ISC channel of uh, Swift. Okay, let me show you and explain a little bit about our uh, Swift uh, journey and what we, how we, what we do with Swift. So we started our first uh, cloud product in uh, 2011. The name was Hubic, and uh, the goal was to provide a space in the cloud for our uh, user to synchronize their data across their different devices. It was, uh, it was based on OpenVT. So uh, as the success comes, quickly we had to think about a more scalable solution and one year later, we, uh, we made some R&D on uh, Swift. So we were in 2012. And uh, after uh, three months to uh, move all our old accounts from OpenVZ to Swift, we were able to run a large cluster. It was not very large uh, in 2012, but uh, it's still the same cluster we are running now. So we had a lot of upgrades and scale actions on this uh, on this cluster. Last year, we launched we launch our uh, public cloud uh, offer, which is a classical YAS uh, product. We provide uh, Nova, Neutron, uh, Glance, Cinder, Keystone, and of course Swift. So if you used to uh, use Swift in uh, another uh, provider, at another provider, you could use it the same uh, at OVH. So you have some number here. Um, the, oh, sorry, the, the difference between, uh, maybe I, I should explain the difference between uh, Ubic and the public cloud. On Ubic, we don't provide the Keystone API. We want to, uh, provide access through our uh, application, web application or mobile application. On uh, public cloud uh, products, we provide all the API, the classical API from Keystone, for every, uh, every product I already uh, mentioned. So you have some number here. We manage uh, more than 25 petabytes of user data, which means uh, we have uh, almost 75 petabytes of space on our disks. We manage more than 10 billion of objects and everything uh, is running on 23,000 devices. So now, let me explain you a little bit uh, of uh, our infrastructure. This is a very high view of our infrastructure. You, uh, we have many uh, clusters. The most important are uh, three, uh, the three most important are two in uh, France and one in North America. They orbit the same, so we deployed the configuration with Puppet and we monitor our cluster with Shinken. Currently, we are running uh, Juno and Mitaka. And on the right side, you have a, a zoom on our infrastructure. First, you have the HR proxy, which is uh, targeted by a round robin DNS, which uh, is the uh, Swift endpoint, in fact. The reason why we use HR proxy is for the SSL computation. HR proxy use the hardware acceleration 
so it's really efficient for the SSL transaction. Then you have the Keystone Galera. I will show you a little bit more on the next slide on these parts. The proxy node uh, holds the uh, account job and the container job. That's why we had to use uh, hardware with good IOPS. And then uh, we have the large uh, storage firm, storage node firm. Uh, here we have different hardware profile. The goal is to have the good ratio between the CPU power and the uh, space available on disks. So this is a, a quick zoom on the relation between IHR proxy and uh, the Keystone Guerrera cluster. As you can see, we route the requests depending on the type of the requests. So if it's a write request, we will send it to one node. And if it's a read request, we will send it to the other node. The reason why we do that is uh, because uh, when we didn't do that, we had uh, many lock on the database. Every uh, write request was sent in and distributed to the different nodes. And we had a lot of, uh, a lot of locks on the database. And with this routing, uh, algorithm, we don't have any uh, lock. And this is a priority list, so if the first node is not available, the HR proxy, uh, HR proxy will select the second node, and et cetera. And we had a similar uh, problem to manage when a node failed, and uh, you want to resync itself. So we use the same uh, list, but in a revert order to avoid the selection of the right node. And uh, with this workflow, we are able to resync without disturbing the whole cluster. So now you have an idea of our uh, infrastructure and uh, the size we managed. Uh, we wanted to share you our automation. So this is the two most important action we have to manage every day almost every day. The first one is uh, adding a node in the cluster, and the second one is manage the failed, drive, the failed disk. <coughs> so what happened when we had a node? This is uh, an overview of our process. The first thing to know is uh, the OVH storage team is a classical customer of the uh, OVH dedicated server team. So as a classical customer, we had to order a new server in our data center through our OVH uh, API. When the server is uh, available, uh, our robot will uh, launch the installation. And when the installation is done, we will collect the profile, the hardware profile of the nodes, and then uh, associate a role to this, uh, to this server in a database. So now we have uh, an available server and a role defined. We are able to, learn, to launch the puppet models. We have 20 puppet models to manage from the uh, disk partitionment and formatting to the HR proxy configuration, for example. So there is uh, no human intervention the whole configuration of the node is managed by Puppet. And then it's time to add the node uh, in the Swift cluster. So it's managed by uh, Swift, manipula uh, Swift ring run manipulation by our robot. Roman will explain you a little bit more about it. That's what I wanted to sh share you here, is that uh, for us adding a new server to our cluster is just about ordering a new server through the, our API. There is no other uh, human intervention. And this is a screenshot of uh, our of, uh, 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 Swift Recon, which describes the uh, device usage. It's one of our cluster. We have many of them like this. Uh, so yes, it describes the, uh, this, the device usage. 
So as you can see, most of our devices are used between 85% and 92%. And uh, as you can see, we have some devices uh, use a little bit more than uh, 50%. And the, it's probably because these devices are uh, added few hours or few, uh, few days ago maybe, and the, uh, the robot we, is filling them more and more, manipulating uh, the ring. And now Romain will explain you how it's done. So uh, what uh, one of the uh, most important part of increasing the cluster size is to add the devices to the ring. Uh, as uh, Jean-Daniel told you, we, uh, we describe our cluster in a database that you can see on the left of the slide. And uh, we have a robot that will uh, try to synchronize uh, the ring with uh, what is in our database so that uh, the ring eventually match uh, what we have in our database. But uh, first of all, uh, it's important to check that you can uh, effectively m manipulate the ring. Uh, so you have to check uh, the, if the cluster is healthy enough to, to be uh, rebalanced. Uh, so uh, the, the metric uh, we want to control is called dispersion. So we, we run on uh, every uh, storage server uh, a probe that uh, will uh, calculate uh, the dispersion uh, of all the local devices. And uh, this information uh, is sent to our monitoring so we can get alerting if uh, dispersion is too high to, uh, on some uh, devices. And also uh, we get graph of the evolution of the dispersion on each device. Uh, this information is also collected uh, on uh, the Swift proxies using an uh, adapted version of uh, Swift Recon uh, middleware and a command line interface. So be before uh, explaining you how uh, the, the probe works, uh, I'm just going to explain you quickly what is dispersion. Uh, dispersion is when uh, data are not where they are supposed to be. Uh, each time you rebalance your ring to add devices, you create dispersion because you ask Swift to move data from one device to another, but moving the data is not uh, immediate, as it may be a gigabyte or terabyte of data. Uh, also, uh, if you have a disk uh, that is uh, down, um, Swift will write data uh, temporary on a backup device, which is called end of device. This is also dispersion. So uh, back to our probe, um, on the left, uh, you can see uh, an example of a small ring. Uh, it's actually a simplified uh, vision of the ring with three replica and four devices. Uh, we see that uh, on this ring, uh, device two is uh, storing partition three, partition one, and partition two. Um, so this is a view of the ring. If you check on your device, uh, a partition is just a folder. Uh, so you can see uh, what partitions are on your device by just listing uh, its content. So in this example, we have partition 1, 2, and 3, but we also have partition 0. Partition 0 must not be here. Uh, it must be on device 0, device 1, and device 3. So we will call it a, a dispersed partition. Um, it may be here because you just rebalanced your ring uh, right before and uh, the process uh, that must fix the dispersion uh, didn't move the data yet. It may also be here uh, because uh, maybe device zero is down and uh, Swift is uh, writing data on device two uh, until device zero get back. Uh, dispersion uh, is fixed by uh, two processes in uh, Swift. It's uh, object uh, replicator and object reconstructors. Uh, so, uh, our probe just compare what's on the device and uh, what's in the ring. Um, this information is sent to monitoring and it will also be collected on the proxies. So all the object servers on the right will calculate their dispersion and uh, the proxy will collect the dispersion of all the devices and calculate an average of the cluster. Um, when uh, our robot uh, decides to uh, modify the ring to uh, increase the cluster, it will first uh, get uh, the dispersion of the cluster uh, from a proxy. 
and it will decide if the cluster is okay to be rebalanced. Um, we consider uh, that uh, the dispersion is okay when it is lower than 0.1%. It's a really low value, but on the, on the normal cluster, it should be under almost every time. So the robot uh, checks the dispersion. If it's okay, it will fetch all the information from the database. It will fetch all the information from the ring of the cluster, and it will compare both, and it will create a list of jobs. We have three kinds of jobs, uh, adding a device to the ring, removing a device, and uh, updating the weight of a device. Uh, quick note on the update uh, of the weight. Uh, I like to keep a friendly relationship with my network team, so uh, I want to avoid to create too much data movement at a time. Uh, that's why we only increase the weight by uh, 100 points at each run. So uh, we have this list uh, of jobs, and they will be applied to the ring, and finally the ring will be uh, rebalanced. Um, then uh, all the object server will get uh, uh, this new ring. Uh, we use AirSync for that. They will fetch uh, the new ring every 30 minutes. And then it's up to Swift uh, to uh, move the data to their correct devices, uh, object replicator or object reconstructor. Um, we use uh, the size of the device uh, as a weight uh, we want to reach, so it's the size in gigabytes. So for example, if we are adding a six terabyte device in the ring, uh, we will try to reach a 6,000 point for the weight. Uh, so if you do a quick math, uh, because we add only 100 points uh, at each one, it means that we have to play this whole scenario uh, up to 60 times uh, for, uh, for a device to be fully added to the ring. Uh, I don't imagine to do the same thing 60 times in a row uh, because it's boring and because it's error prone, so uh, that's why we automated it. Uh, increasing a, a cluster is, is something we do a lot, uh, but there is something we do more. Uh, it's replacing uh, the failing disk. Uh, every year, we change, uh, we replace about a thousand disks uh, in our clusters. It's an average of three disks per year. Uh, yes, three disks per day. Sorry. Um, if you work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I don't do that. I only work uh, five days a week, uh, and clearly not 24 hours a day. So uh, it's more like uh, five uh, disks per day. Uh, so if we had to do it uh, by a human, uh, it would be a half-time job because replacing a disk is not just replacing the disk. You have to do some check before, and there is a lot of operation to do after, after the replacement. Um, for, for that, um, for the disk replacement, we rely a lot on, uh, on monitoring. Uh, as uh, Jean-Daniel told you, we use uh, Shinken for, for the monitoring, and because the number uh, of servers and devices uh, we have in our clusters, we use a passive check. Um, passive check means it's a server that sends the information uh, to the monitoring server. So to, to be able to write good automation, uh, you have to, to have the right information uh, of the state of your cluster. Uh, so we basically write uh, a probe for every recurring problem. And of course, failing disk is one of the most recurring problems. Um, we have uh, three ways to consume uh, all the information uh, in our monitoring. The first one is a web interface for the human. The second one is uh, text messages for the people on duty. And uh, the last one uh, is uh, an API uh, for all of our robots. Uh, there is one uh, we, uh, we really like. Uh, we call it self healing that's him on the picture. Uh, its job is to uh, control what is going on uh, in our clusters and to take decisions. For example, um, if uh, a server is non-responsive, uh, the robot will hard reboot it. If um, an object replicator is stuck, uh, self healing will restart the process. And if we have a disk failing, uh, the robot will decide to replace it. Uh, as I told you, uh, replacing a disk uh, involves uh, many steps and uh, many checks. Um, it's mainly a four-step process. Um, the first one is collecting the information 
uh, about uh, the alarms in the monitoring. So the robots will connect to the monitoring API and get all the alarms uh, of the failing disk. Then it will decide if it's safe or not to replace the disk. I will uh, uh, say more about that uh, just later. And if it's safe, uh, it will set the server on maintenance. It will create a ticket to uh, our data center uh, team so that they physically replace the disk. And then uh, when it's done, uh, it will reinstall the operating system if it's needed, if it was a primary disk. And it will run Puppet. Puppet will uh, format the disk, mount it, uh, restart the process uh, if it's needed. And uh, once it's done, if we have no more alarms on the server, um, the, the server will be set off maintenance and then it's back in production. Um, I just told you um, that the robot have to decide if it's safe to replace a disk or not. Uh, what it means uh, for a disk replacement to be safe, um, it's uh, the safety of all the partition it is uh, storing. Uh, we have a, another example of a ring here um, and we have an alarm on the device 2. So we will check uh, uh, what partitions are on device 2. So in this example, it's a partition 3, 1, and 2. So we will check that each of these partitions are safe. For example, uh, if we check partition 3, uh, we see it is stored on device 0 and device 5. So we will check that device 0 and device 5 are OK. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, they are OK if there is no alarm uh, for this device, but also if the device uh, haven't been replaced recently. Uh, why that? Uh, because if device zero was changed uh, one hour ago, sure, there are no alarms on it, but also there is no data on the disk because it takes time to uh, resynchronize the disk to reconstruct all the data that must be on it. Um, we made some bench and we know that in our cluster, um, one terabyte of data, it takes 12 hours to reconstruct it. So depending on the size of the disk, we know how long we must wait to be sure every data are back on the disk. Uh, so we will do this check for every partition. And if every partition are OK, uh, it means we can safely change the disk. So in this example, if device 0, device 5, and device 6 are OK, it's safe to replace device 2. So the robot will do all the steps um, I just described uh, right before. Um, there is one last thing about uh, disk replacement, um, a tricky thing. Uh, if you try to hot replace um, a disk in your server, if it supports it, uh, you cannot always unmount the disk because some IOs may be stuck uh, on your file system because it is corrupted. So we, we tried many ways to do it the right way, like killing the process, like uh, trying to unmount force the disk or unmount lazily the disk. And at best, it was not working. And at worst, uh, the kernel was crashing. So we took the easy way, the most uh, secure way, to just take off the disk without unmounting the file system first. Sure, the kernel will cry a bit, but in the end, it's OK for it. And um, But the tricky part is if you take off the disk without unmounting it, um, the, the block device is still in use in the kernel. So when the new disk will be put in the server, it won't get the same letter. For example, if you're taking off SDB, you rack a new disk, it will be named SDC because SDB is still in use. And as we automated the formatting of the, of the disk, uh, it was a bit tricky to say to Puppet that now the disk that was SDB is SDC. And uh, we don't like to guess uh, this kind of information when it's about formatting a device. So um, we implemented a kind of constant naming of the device uh, in UDAV. Uh, we use um, a name for the device based on the enclosure ID and the slot ID of the disk. <laughs> people, <laughs> some people are OK with me. <laughs> so um, this way, uh, no matter the order uh, you put your disk in the server, uh, even if you reboot the server, they will always get the same name. So it's safe uh, to do formatting with Puppet or stuff like that. Um, so this is how we, we automated uh, the disk replacement in our clusters. Um, as you can see, no human intervention. 
because humans do do wrong things, they do errors when they do things, uh, and our robots uh, are really reliable. Uh, but with all these automations, I mean, there are no more work for humans because the robots do everything. It was almost getting boring to manage shift clusters. So that's why we, we had to create some, some new challenges for us. Um, the current challenge uh, we're trying to achieve uh, is to uh, convert uh, about 20 petabytes of data to a razor coding. And I'm sure we will have a nice feedback to give on that uh, pretty soon. It's a work in progress. Uh, so we hope to be able to present uh, this, uh, this result uh, in Barcelona in six months. Thank you. If you have any questions, it's the time. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'd like to thank uh, David, which is, uh, which is in France and which is managing the cluster while, while uh, I'm having fun here. Uh, how you deal with uh, enclosure hang-ups? Uh, because sometimes drives can hang wall enclosure and all disks become unresponsible. How you do know which drive to extract? Thank you. Um, so we... We check uh, smart values and we check the kernel messages from the uh, we check the kernel messages in our probe, and uh, we are able to link uh, the kernel name, so SDB, with the name we gave. We we wrote in Perl uh, some sub for that, and it was not your question, maybe. Uh, not exactly. Uh, there is a case assessment device. Uh, block all I/O on enclosure it connected to, so you get uh, me uh, kernel messages for every device in this enclosure. They all looks like failed, but only one device is real uh, source of the problem. We never had this kind of oh. issue. You are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, what base operating system are you using? Uh, we are running on Debian. Okay, and are you using the Puppet OpenStack modules? Uh, we are using some of them, for, um, for example, for Keystone. And for Swift, uh, we started our own module a long time ago, so we are still running on it. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, do you guys have any problems typically with uh, the extra I.O.? you incur from a rebalance affecting your uh, latencies on customer side API traffic at all? Um, it, it depends really on the size of the cluster and the kind of disk uh, you choose. Uh, no matter the size of the disk, if you're running SATA disk, you have the same amount of uh, IOPS available. So if you have more disk, you don't have this kind of issue. So we try to create big clusters with small disk and it works better. But of course, there is uh, some impact of the, on the performance of the cluster. But sure. most of the time, it's not, uh, it's not really important. OK. And can you um, talk a little bit through what your, your zoning strategy is within the ring? Uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah. Uh, can you talk about uh, how you structure your zones in the actual Swift ring? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so f we create a cluster. Um, we don't use uh, the multi-region uh, feature uh, in Swift. All uh, of our cluster is built on one zone in one data center. Um, and we create, uh, we use, uh, to start a cluster, a part power of 18 or 19, depending on what we think would be the future of the cluster. And that's basically all for a ring. Yeah, one zone in one data center. When you were describing the dispersion collection that you have uh, run per node, um, and then you're retrieving those metrics via the proxy, which is not your stock dispersion populate dispersion report commands. Uh, so I wonder if those enhancements or changes that you guys have made is something that's currently available or if you think that they might be interesting enough to uh, share. Uh, or maybe you could go into more detail about how they're different from uh, what other people are maybe using. Yeah, um, they're not available for now. They can be, but um, they are based on our probe. 
which I don't think can would be merged upstream uh, because it, it runs every five minutes and it sometimes takes a lot of time to run because we have to do a list here of all devices and also we have to check if the partition really has data. So we check the content of the partition and uh, so it takes time so we cannot do, uh, cannot do it in the recon uh, middleware because it will, it will block a uh, uh, worker uh, during the time of the run, which is about one minute. Uh, so it's a problem running Chrome and uh, information collected with a Swift recon. So yeah, I, I think that's a great strategy, just run, run it in Cron and dump it out into var run Swift and then have the recon interface to, yeah, to But if it. you think uh, uh, it can be uh, interesting for everybody, uh, I will try yeah, to commit yeah. it, of course. Yeah, I think so. I think, okay. yeah, it's, in some ways it's a better way to organize the problem. Does the, um, does the collection look for both misplaced partitions and also missing partitions? I mean, at 10 billion objects, you guys have a pretty filled out. Uh, cluster, so every partition that might exist in the cluster surely does. Uh, that directory is somewhere. So would, would the dispersion metric that that node is collecting for a device say, hey, according to the ring, this partition should exist on me and it's, it's not here, um, as much as say, um, I have this partition that actually belongs somewhere else, or, or, or either, do you report either direction or do you differentiate, or is one more important than the other in your experience? Uh, we only uh, report a misplaced partition because when a cluster is starting, uh, <laughs> there is no way to know if a partition is missing or, or if it just doesn't exist yet. Exist yet. So for now, we only report misplaced partitions. And when you do the collection, do you have something running in the, like the proxy is sort of like admin middleware, or do you just hit the recon interface on all of the object nodes sort of concurrently? Uh, we, so we extended the recon middleware on the object server and we patched the Swift recon CLI to generate a JSON file for every metric uh, the recon can, uh, can get. That sounds like another yeah. interesting enhancement. Sure. For <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> All right, that's, I think Go that's on. it for now. Great work. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you, everybody.